Statewide broadcasts of Your Legislators are made possible by the Minnesota Corn Growers Association. From developing best practices that help farmers better protect our natural resources to the latest innovations in corn-based plastics, Minnesota corn farmers are proud to invest in third-party research, leading to a more sustainable future for our local communities. Additional support by Minnesota Farmers Union, standing for agriculture, working for farmers on the web at mfu.org. We welcome you to another session of Your Legislators, a roundtable discussion featuring state lawmakers answering your questions and discussing important issues affecting the citizens of Minnesota. Join the conversation online on Twitter and Facebook. Now here's your moderator for tonight's program, Barry Anderson. I know, I heard. Good evening and welcome to this week's version of Your Legislators. We're delighted that you have joined us on this spring evening for an hour of discussion with leaders of our Minnesota legislature about issues that are of concern to the people of the state of Minnesota. We're delighted you're with us. This is your program and we invite you to call in with your questions, the, ver the instructions, uh, Twitter, um, uh, fax, uh, phone, uh, all of that will be displayed on your uh, television screen. And I remind you that you can call in uh, and send in your questions to us uh, even when we're not on the air. We'll store those questions up and we'll use them for next week's panel. I'd also remind you that the kinds of questions that this panel is well positioned to answer are questions about what's happening at the Minnesota legislature. They're not well positioned to fix the immigration problem, address the federal budget, or discuss what the budget for NASA should be. Um, we'll leave that to uh, other legislators. We're gonna begin this evening uh, by introducing our distinguished panel of guests who will help us unravel the mysteries of St. Paul and giving them an opportunity to describe their background, the committees they serve on, um, their time in the legislature, what their day job might be, and whatever else uh, might be important to bring to your attention. And let's begin with, uh, with our senior legislator on the panel. If I've got my history correct, I think Senator Anderson uh, from District 29, uh, Buffalo Township. I think you have been in the legislature longer than anybody else here. So the floor is yours. Tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you, Barry. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, my name is Senator Bruce Anderson. I live in Buffalo Township, uh, rural uh, Buffalo, uh, just outside of the city of Buffalo City, and uh, have lived here since 1976 when I moved uh, to with my wife. And, and at that time, one adopted Korean daughter, and we've been here since 19 uh, May, coming up uh, 20 by 40 some years anyway that I've been here. I've been in the legislature since 1995, and uh, have been on many committees. Uh, this year, I serve on the Veterans uh, and Military Affairs Committee. I also sit on the Judiciary and uh, Public Safety Committee, and I also sit on Civil Law Committee, along with uh, I am co-chair on the Claims Committee. And uh, we've been going through many omnibus bills and taking up different legislation to take to the floor. Um, it's been always a challenge and always a joy. And just like any job, uh, everybody says, uh, I wouldn't want your jo job for all the tea in China. And uh, I said, well, um, I've been with uh, situations where I didn't have enough tea to give you uh, to be in this job. So, but I appreciate the, uh, fact that uh, I've gone out and spoke with my constituents and talked with them. And uh, each year when election year comes around, I get out and door knock and lit drop and talk with them. And I'm very honored and very privileged to be in the position here as their state senator and representing uh, Buffalo. I represent most of Wright County, uh, basically uh, the southern part and western part. Uh, Senator Kiffmeyer has the eastern part. And then I have just a little sliver of Hennepin County and Rockford, which goes up to Greenfield. And so that's my new area. And with the census uh, being taken, uh, we'll find out in the next two years where the new lines are going to be drawn to find out if I have a different Senate district. And I'm sure I will, because it changes every 10 years in that matter. 
Uh, thank you, Senator Anderson. And we'll go to Senator Swazinski from Eden Prairie. So Senator Swazinski was with us, I think, earlier this year already. So, uh, but nonetheless, let's go through the drill again, Senator. Tell the viewers a little bit about yourself. Yeah, um, thanks, Barry. Um, I um, grew up in Superior, Wisconsin, and uh, so don't ask me my affiliation with um, the sports teams uh, between these two wonderful states. I um, taught um, American government for 33 years at Eden Prairie High School, loved every minute of it, came to retire six, five years ago, and um, it was only, uh, I wasn't ready to full on retire, so I ran for um, state senate, decided to kind of um, show all those 12,000 students what I was trying to teach them, and um, found out that everything I taught them wasn't necessarily, especially when it came to how a bill becomes a law, 101. Um, now that, and I, so I'm, I've been serving in the Minnesota Senate for the last five years. And um, I was on the Veterans Committee for four years, and I got to serve alongside um, um, Senator Anderson, who was, um, and I've told them this over the years, um, one of the um, best chairs I've ever had the privilege of serving alongside of um, um, in veterans. And that was just such a wonderful committee. And it, it left a huge impact on me. But um, this last um, two or last after this election, um, I was put on um, local government and um, rather than veterans. And then I've been on environment and education um, for the last five years. And uh, you know, I, 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 I think the, the, my two colleagues today will, will concur on this. It's, it's a wonderful place to work. And I never thought in a million years I'd find something I love more than teaching. And, um, and, I, and I did. And because um, it's like being back in college, but now I want to learn everything that everybody has to offer to try to teach me. So thank you. Senator Kuzinski, I believe you were there, uh, if I'm recalling correctly, I believe you were there the day the Supreme Court came to Eden Prairie High School. Uh, uh and we had an oral argument. Uh, my colleague, uh, Paul Anderson, was getting ready to retire from the court. He grew up in Eden Prairie and uh, sort of pulled the uh, seniority card and said, we're going to Eden Prairie. Uh, and uh, we had a great visit to, to the high school there. Yeah, I remember it well. The whole senior class, I, I, as I recall, attended. And it was just a, what I hope um, that they continue doing that. And it's a wonderful opportunity for high schools to find out what um, the, one of the three branches up to in St. Paul. We uh, we uh, will move on here, but just as a as an aside, uh, we've been affected. Of course, the, the judicial branch has been affected like everyone else by the pandemic, and so those visits have been suspended. But I think the plan is by next fall we're going to be back on the road again, uh, going somewhere. We'll see where it is. But uh, but in any event, uh, thank you for your work uh, teaching civics. I'm a I'm a huge supporter of uh, our our uh, many civics and and government teachers throughout Minnesota. Uh, well, that sales, we'll finish with that sales pitch now, and we'll move on to uh, uh, Representative Andrew Carlson from Bloomington, who is joining us for the first time this evening. Representative Carlson, we're delighted that uh, you gave up an hour of your evening to, to talk to us this evening. Tell our viewers a little bit about your background, how long you've been in the legislature, day job, what other kinds of uh, what committees you serve on, and uh, issues of concern in the legislature. The floor is yours. Sure. Uh, thanks, Barry, and thanks for the invite. It's good to be here. Uh, State Representative Andrew Carlson. Uh, my district is uh, 50B, which is uh, all within the city of Bloomington. Uh, let's see. As far as committee assignments, we'll run through those real quick. I'm vice chair of state government finance. I serve on the Commerce, uh, Finance, and Policy Committee, Event of Health, uh, which is, I think, very timely in terms of everything we have going on uh, at this time, uh, and of course, taxes. It's always good to serve on the committee that uh, brings the money into governments, and then all the other committees uh, get to spend it. So, um, let's see, uh, married, I uh, have two daughters in uh, Bloomington High School, so we're very busy uh, over the course of this past winter. Uh, you know, our Wi-Fi got a real workout, so uh, glad that the, the kids are finally uh, back in school, and, you know, it's, um, it's, still, it's still a struggle, uh, but um, progress, I think, is being made uh, on that front. So uh, just a shout out to all the teachers and faculty that, uh, that make this happen. It, can't think of enough for, um, you know, making in-classroom uh, education possible. So with that, um, I mean, that's kind of the current state of affairs. Uh, obviously we're right in the middle of uh, uh, moving forward with our omnibus bills. Uh, I'm sure there'll be some questions around that in terms of uh, where we are in terms of the session, but um, figure why don't we just uh, kick things off and get to some questions. 
Let's do that. And let's go uh, right away to a viewer from Granite Falls who wants to um, visit about, um, wants the panel to discuss uh, not so much the specifics of the tragedy that happened in Brooklyn Center recently, but rather whether that will prompt additional legislation during this session. By way of background, uh, my recollection is during one of the special sessions last year, uh, there was uh, legislation dealing with uh, police training and related topics that, that did in fact pass, uh, but I understand there uh, are other discussions that are going on now. Let's start with uh, uh, Senator Swazinski. Um, uh, maybe you can um, lead off here, talk a little bit about what's going on in the Senate, and we'll go to uh, Representative Anderson and finish up with uh, Senator Carlson, or Representative Carlson. Yeah, thanks. It's um, a question I think about 6 million Minnesotans have on their mind right now, um, no matter where you live. And the, 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 what happened in Brooklyn Center, it's, it's a tragedy. And, um, you know, for both families, um, the police officer, I, I believe, clearly thought she had her taser in her hand. And, um, and so, and then uh, as, as because of her error of, of judgment, um, there was, there's been a loss of life. And so, uh, so now we have to ask ourselves what good can come out of this tragedy, if, if any good. And um, boy, I tell you, um, I, first thing I want, thought of is, um, is there a way that we can have tasers be <laughs> so you're no one will ever because evidently it happens it's happened throughout the country on a few occasions and so if there's a way that we can somehow um, there's no mistaking between a taser and a handgun um, and so, um, so but with respect to the Senate um, and, and and Mr. Anderson or Senator Anderson excuse me will probably have some impact in um, in um, some insights into this too but it sounds like um, we're gonna have a hearing on some information. I do believe it's in judiciary um, with Senator Limmer, the chair. And, um, and, but because it is a budget year, um, if the, 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 the leadership has been suggesting that maybe we might, in order to make some of the decisions that we need to have um, to, to, to make, might have to wait until next, um, next, um, next winter um, when we're not in a budget year. And it's, it's been, uh, as, as my two colleagues will concur, it's the social um, on, uh, on upheaval and um, economic uncertainty and COVID on top of it. And and then to have the two tragic, um, you know, murders of, of our, our two residents um, on top of it. Uh, it's, it's been a really trying year to, uh, to be an elected official at any level of government. So, but I hope um, between the 201 of us, we try to somehow make the state a better place. So, Senator Anderson, your thoughts? Well, I, I know from uh, just having talked with the chair, uh, Chair Limmer, that he was asked by the majority leader if uh, there's a possibility to have an informational hearing on the tragedy that took place. And so uh, they're working out the details. Uh, he, he, Senator Limmer couldn't give me a de determination or date or time, but he thought that maybe as we get into May that that would, would happen. But because the deadlines for all bills uh, have, have ended, both in the House and the Senate, the likelihood of, of going forward with any type of a bill or information that would pass by both the House and the Senate uh, would probably not happen. Uh, mainly informational to take gu guidelines, get information, get some uh, purpose and, and reason lay in a kind of a foundation to go forward with a foundation or for a bill coming up in the coming uh, months after legislation or after we're out of the legislature. And that could happen on a special session as we go into June and, and July. <clears throat> we don't know how long the uh, emergency uh, is going to continue and uh, how long we're going to be in this shutdown uh, from the, the governor's position. So we're, we're kind of waiting to see what happens, but we know that there's possibility of information coming forward. And I truly got to believe that the, the as suggested by Senator Swazinski, is that trying to figure out how to help officers in dealing with this. I mean, here's a 20 year officer, 20 years in service officer, pulls out the wrong weapon thinking she had a taser and uh, thinking it was a taser because it's basically in the same form as a um, pistol. Uh, and unfortunately, 
uh, misused it in a, in a way that was not her intent. So we're hoping to maybe come up with some uh, recommendations from either the public or from law enforcement themselves, or even from, from the bureaucracy as to how to deal with certain future situations. But Representative Carlson, your thoughts and uh, what's uh, transpiring in the House? Yeah, thank you, Barry. Um, and it, this has been on the House DFL's mind now for, for quite a while. And uh, with, the, uh, with the killing of George Floyd over the summer and the, the killing of uh, Dante Wright uh, just this past week at the hands of uh, police has been a, a, real, been a real tough week. Uh, there are many, uh, myself included, as well as my constituents, are angered and saddened by these uh, tragic events. Uh, we absolutely must do more in terms of police reform. And, um, uh, you know, I'll be perfectly blunt in saying that uh, uh, Senate Republicans need to get on board with that reform. Uh, we have passed uh, numerous bills out of committee in the DFL controlled house dealing with uh, police uh, uh, reforms, uh, I think 11 plus uh, some more earlier this week. Uh, and we need to see that work proceed before the end of this legislative session. I will say uh, in the spirit of bipartisanship and uh, coming together, uh, we did do that this summer. And just real quick with the uh, very important legislation we did pass over the summer with the, uh, uh, as an outcome of the um, uh, murder of George Floyd, uh, some of the things that we did accomplish. And, you know, I think this is where we need to start. Um, so we took care of uh, the use of reforming, uh, reforming the use of force, uh, investigation reforms, banning warrior training, banning chokeholds, adding a duty to, uh, to intercede, police residency reform, arbitration reform, data collection and regulatory reform, uh, mental health training and autism training. We can get this done. Uh, and as House DFLers said at the onset of this, that was just the beginning. Now we have more reasons than before to continue with that good work. So yes, uh, this is a budget year. Yes, we do have other important work before us, but this is absolutely have to uh, be a part of the outcome uh, as part of this legislative session. All right, well, we'll have an opportunity to discuss that uh, in the remaining weeks of the session, I'm sure. So we have a question from a viewer who, uh, notes that there was a uh, vote on the, um, if I'm getting this correct here, uh, the Minnesota Senate had debated lifting a, a, a moratorium on nuclear power plants. And the viewer is wondering whether there's going to be anything happening on that. Let's start with one of our senators, Senator Anderson. Um, anything happening with nuclear power plants in the Senate? Well, it's been a, a, a touchy subject ever since I've been in the legislature. And it's, uh, if anybody remembers Representative Kahn, she, uh, back in the 90s, uh, when I came in, was always dead set against having this, and she was one of the ones that uh, put the moratorium on regarding the different situations that had happened at nuclear plants across the country. And as we go forward with this, uh, the, the asking of the nuclear power moratorium to be lifted uh, is critical to looking at how we uh, look at the base load of providing electricity uh, power across the, the state of Minnesota. Right now, almost 16% of the base load is made up of nuclear power. If you take a look at uh, solar power and wind power, we're looking at 0.5 tenths of 1% uh, of the base load for power uh, from wind and solar. And I know that everybody wants to go with carbon free and the, the big carbon free uh, monster in the room is nuclear power. And so as much as they don't like it, uh, I think that we have to be realistic and not have to be worried about blackouts or brownouts like they have in California or to deal with the situation like they had just down in Texas. So it's, I think we need to, to get that discussion continually, continue to get that discussion before us because both the nuclear power plant in my district, Monticello, and the one in Red Wing is up for renewal in 2030 and 2033. Representative Carlson, your thoughts on the nuclear power moratorium and uh, nuclear power generally, wh where that might go? Uh, thanks, Barry. Uh, the future is in wind and solar. You know, uh, nuclear power just is, is uh, in my opinion, uh, you know, needs to be 
withdrawn from our power system and we need to increase investments in wind and solar. Um, speaking with, uh, with the folks at the uh, Prairie, Prairie Island Indian community, uh, you know, they've dealt with this their entire lives. Uh, we need to see, you know, this impacts people's lives that live in proximity to this. Uh, this is just not the type of direction that we need to go as a state. Uh, the investment needs to be full speed ahead on wind and solar. Senator uh, Swazinski. Yeah, thanks. Um, my first foray into politics was a demonstration in Rapid City, South Dakota in 1978 and um, anti-nuclear rally. And it turns out Representative Hornstein and I may have been within a few feet of each other at that event. Of course, we didn't, you know, know each other, but um, I, um, last year I did tour the, the nuclear facility in Prairie Island and God, I got to tell you, that place is spotless. You could have eaten a, um, your lunch off the floor. And, uh, but that, um, I voted against lifting the moratorium simply because the spent fuel rods, I just, they, I just don't know what to do with them. And um, we're, 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 we're you know, throwing up our arms, so to speak. Um, yes, it's clean. It's renewable. Um, but nonetheless, the spent fuel rods, they're just storing, in, storing them, um, you know, in, in Red Wing, just outside of town there. And uh, we thought we had a, a place to store them in Nevada, and that fell through, and yucca, or maybe it was called or something, um, co coincidentally. The mountain, and, in, uh, yes, in Nevada. So Yeah. And um, so anyways, we'll see what the future holds. But boy, right now, it just doesn't seem until we figure out how to, how to, what to do with the spent fuel rods. It doesn't seem like, um, in my opinion, nuclear energy has a future. Well, I think, uh, Mr. Anderson, uh, the fact that if we could do like France does and recycle the nuclear rods, if we were allowed to do that from the Federal Energy Commission uh, to do that here in the United States, we would be able to get rid of a lot of our nuclear energy, but everybody's afraid of being it, that it would become uh, military grade and then available for use in, as far as war. And so we, we need to get over that issue because France has been doing it for years, decades. Uh, so um, we need to take a look at that because there is a means by which to get rid of the nuclear rods. We just not have to take and be brave and take that step and, and move into that issue. So let's talk a little bit about education. We have viewers who are concerned about both the uh, uh, K-12, what I would say K-12, no, I say I think we would say pre-K to, uh, to uh, high school graduation uh, budgets uh, and, um, and also the higher education. Let's start with uh, elementary and secondary education first. And let's start with you, Representative Carlson. Um, what is the status of our education budget uh, process in this legislative session? Where would you like to see it go? Thank you. Obviously, education is very important to me, uh, as well as many of my constituents. Uh, unfortunately, I don't serve on the education committee. Uh, so I am going to um, refer to some notes here. So where that stands, let's see. Um, you know, obviously, uh, in light of this last year's uh, pandemic and, and the uh, studying at home and just everything that schools have been through, we need to make a solid investment in summer learning. Not summer school, but summer learning. Kids that have fallen behind need to be given that opportunity uh, to catch up uh, over the summer months. And that comes with a price tag. Uh, that's, that's not gonna be cheap. Uh, but uh, you know, our budget should be a reflection of our values as a state. And I can't think of anything more important than investing in our next generation of leaders. Uh, uh, Senator Swazinski, education K-12. Yeah, uh, I am on the education committee and proudly. And, you know, 44% um, of the state budget um, goes to E-12. Um, Barry is kind of the, um, um, has replaced pre-K-12. Uh, anyways, 44% of- a certain age, Senator, you, um, <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard to teach the old dog the new tricks, but I'll, yeah. I'll look at you, E-12. <laughs> Yeah, and if I didn't, wasn't on the committee, I wouldn't know that. So anyways, 
Um, so 44% of the budget um, of the state budget goes for education and uh, we, we can do better. Our Article 13 of the Minnesota State Constitution uh, um, begins with um, a, re a, a Republican form of government dependent upon the intelligence of the people. Um, it is the duty of the legislature to um, uh, create a general and uniform system of public schools, um, verbatim, right out of the constitution. So we have a, a duty, the Senate and the House, to, to create a general and uniform system of public schools. And I don't know if we've done that. And, I, and I'm not pointing fingers at where both sides of the aisle are, 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 have been in power during times when the, it hasn't been funded properly. But um, when you take into account inflation, I think the years 2003 were, were like 20% um, behind in funding for our schools where we were um, in 2003. And, and um, but you know, I, I, I know you didn't ask about the page amendment, but um, you know, and I, I am opposed to the page amendment, but um, 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 what, God, what is the guy's name? Card um, um, oh, uh, uh, Neil Kashkari. Yeah, Kashkari yeah, and, um, and Justice Page. I, I got to compliment them. They're getting people talking about education. And, and that's a good thing. So we're talking about it. And I think if COVID, if there's a silver lining, if for lack of a better phrase to COVID, it's, it's woken us up to um, the, the, that we, um, the education, the, the gap, the opportunity gap, the achievement gap, whatever you um, refer to the gap is, is glaring in our face. And so there's a lot of work to be done and, and, and we'll do our best, you know, between the House and the Senate, and um, the uh, to, um, we're the, uh, no one. I'm surprised no one's brought this up yet. We're the only divided legislature uh, in all 50 states, and so it, it's if for minute if you get frustrated with us at the legislature, please keep that in mind. Um, we're doing the best we can um, under the circumstances, but anyways. Well, as an old civics, uh, I shouldn't say old, but as a veteran civics teacher, uh, you know all about the sand in the gears and the founders did not have in mind efficient government, right? That's right. <laughs> so anyway, Senator Anderson, um, uh, we won't let the civics, uh, the civics teachers here be wild with the program. Talk a little bit about uh, E-12 education. Well, uh, thank you, Barry. Uh, the E-12 uh, chairman uh, is uh, Senator Chamberlain and I had a conversation with him uh, just uh, a few days ago. And he's saying that uh, our, uh, Concern for, uh, as uh, Representative Carlson mentioned, the need for summer learning. Uh, he said that they are going to be fully funding summer learning in his bill, and he's looking forward to uh, increasing the amount of money. The big concern is, uh, and it's a concern not only in Education Committee, but it's a concern in all the committees, is all these federal dollars that are coming in. In fact, I've heard that there's so much money coming in, they don't know where they're going to spend it or how they're going to spend it. The, Come from the federal government. And I think it's bypassing uh, some of us as far as uh, the leadership or the, the committees or even the, the governor. I'm, I'm not sure if it's, uh, I really haven't figured out how and where that money is going to be coming in, but I've heard it's being targeted at different locations. It was just like I sit on the Ag Committee and we're talking about broadband. Well, they're talking about some a huge amount of money coming in for broadband, but getting back to education, uh, the, the uh, Senator Chamberlain is, is talking about increasing the amount of money for education. So that's a good news. It, it's, uh, but like Senator Swazinski, how far we are behind, I'm not sure. But my big concern is that we're losing kids out of our school system because parents are fed up with the COVID situation and being locked down and having their kids not being able to participate in some of their activities that they've had, that they pulled them out of the public school. Uh, my school here in Buffalo, Hanover, Montrose, uh, they're down 250 kids. Uh, and that's money that comes in from the general, from the, the school to the school, to them, to for each of the, those children that show up. So uh, will they go back again? I'm not sure, but uh, so many different questions to ask. And, and that's what Senator Chamberlain mentioned to me when he was talking about his bill that uh, he, he's got some big, big uh, un, unanswered question as to how the money is going to flow. Representative Carlson, let's uh, go back to you um, on the education front and give you um, a moment to talk about uh, the higher education budget and where that might go. And I know also that uh, maybe we can throw in here, although the, the uh, viewer didn't actually raise this specific question, maybe we can throw in the uh, question about the Board of Regents and uh, 
and how that's all coming along. But uh, but let's start with uh, let's start with higher education, Representative Carlson. Your thoughts on that, and then we'll go to Senator Anderson and, and Senator Swazinski. Yeah, well, again, with education, a lot of the, you'll see a lot of similarities in terms of what the needs are. Uh, you know, we we do need to fund higher education. Uh, our universities have uh, struggled just as much as our, our public schools as well. And while uh, that work continues, that funding uh, needs to be in place so that, uh, again, to allow for those opportunities uh, for students to, to get the education they need. You know, and with, with funding higher ed, we're talking more in terms of uh, faculty and, and facilities, right? Well, you know, same could be said about both, but making sure that that money is spent in a way to address the needs from a COVID standpoint and keeping students and faculty safe is going to be key. Um, you know, we'll be bringing that bill forward here in the uh, next week. Uh, we'll see where that lands. But um, again, I think it's one of those things where those that serve on the committee are, are going to be hitting their targets and, and, you know, trying to ensure that that money gets spent uh, the best way possible. So I wish I could speak more to specifics at this point, but it's a, that's a, a question that's probably going to be a good one for next week too, once that bill kind of uh, hits the House floor. Senator Anderson, higher education. Higher education was on the House, or on the Senate floor, I should say. Yesterday, uh, Senator Tomasoni was the, the chair of the, the uh, Higher Education Committee and brought forth a bill. Um, the, the target, uh, I, we were told, uh, was what was he was given, and uh, yet the, it was not supposedly enough uh, money to, to help with higher education. Uh, all the specifics of that bill um, seem to reach out, and yet not enough to meet the uh, uh, dollars needed to upgrade facilities, uh, but it did reach out to meet the needs of the higher education students. Senator Swazinski? Yeah. Um... When in back in the late 70s, it was $500 a quarter for me to attend the University of Minnesota. So I could work full part time and go to school and pay for it without um, ever taking out a student loan. And um, I didn't know this at the time, but the legislature in those days was paying 60% of the of the University of Minnesota's um, expenses and you were paying 40%. And that those numbers have been flipped in the last, um, you know, um, well, I'm not going to date myself here. In, in the last many years, it's gone from 60 to 40%. And, you know, and I, I'm not here to even suggest what the, uh, how we can do, fund it better, but it's, it's, it's a problem. The kids, they shouldn't be graduating with, you know, 60, 70, $50,000 in debt. Uh, it's unacceptable and we're dropping the ball. This is an investment in our future. Um, kids want to stay in Minnesota schools. We should be in, in, encouraging that and rewarding it. Um, and so uh, that's my two cents on, on, on funding. I do know, um, yeah, it's it. There's going to be some hits at the university of at on both campus on the the system this fall, I think. And 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 you asked about the regents. Um, that's um, part of this job. I had no idea we were responsible for when I first got elected, and um, and I'm not doing this because I think both sides are guilty. But I, I I'm sure um, my two colleagues would agree. I it's unbelievable how politicized. The, uh, the, the selection of the regents is. And um, I, I don't know, it just doesn't seem like it should be a, politi a political thing. I mean, the regents are there to help the school system. And, um, but anyways, um, I, 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 you asked about the regents and so. Uh, is, is that vote, that's a vote of the body as a whole, 201 members, as I recall. Is that, has that been scheduled or uh, do, do we, we know when that's gonna occur? We had it. We, it's already been done. Okay. Yeah, a week or two week ago. ago. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. That that part of when we're in live, I mean, it's one of the two times we all get together, and it's 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 cool. It's fun. Um, the pomp and circumstance, so to speak. It's it's one of those nights where you feel really good about being a a member of the state legislature. So we have a question from um, a viewer about what might be pending in the legislature this year on veterans issues. So let's go to you, Senator Anderson. Uh, what, what, uh, what, if anything, might be taking place relative to veterans issues, if anything? Well, uh, you should probably start with Senator Swarzynski today because he's the one that uh, 
pulled the rabbit out of the hat and uh, brought forth the Restorative Justice Act that we had passed three times last year, and that's dealing with uh, veterans courts that uh, I, along with uh, several members from the Judiciary Committee, visited in Anoka County last, uh, was in 2019, I think it was, uh, and we found that that court really went, went, went well, and the veterans that were there had a certain procession, uh, procedure by which they followed, and the judge required them to follow and to make sure that they uh, met all the requirements and the deadlines uh, that the judge wanted to have. And we just, we were very impressed with what would happen. So today, the, uh, Senator Swazinski brought an amendment to the floor and unanimously, except for I think one, uh, voted for the uh, Veterans Restorative Justice Act to be uh, put on the Judiciary Committee. And though at the same time, uh, Senator Lang, who is the chairman of the Veterans Committee, had just this morning on the in finance had uh, brought an amendment to put the Restorative Justice Act in his Veterans and Military Affairs Bill that is uh, going to be joined up with uh, state government finance. It's a combination of the bill. Uh, right now, we've met all the requirements. Uh, I should say most of the requirements that, that the uh, Department of uh, Veterans and Military Affairs required. Uh, we made sure that their benefits uh, were at 100%. Uh, we came up with a little bit shortage in some areas of home, homelessness, uh, which uh, is a big deal for Commissioner Herkey. Uh, he wants to make sure that we Minnesota goes to zero as far as veterans who are homeless here in the state. And uh, we're getting reports. I was just in a, what they call a UVLC meeting yesterday, and uh, they are talking about uh, bringing that number of, I think it, they said it was like we're 201 or 205 homeless veterans and they're, they're pushing down downwards and slowly we're gonna get that. Another thing is uh, the suicide rate for veterans coming out of the service that served in Afghanistan or Iraq, wherever they might've served even the, during this past wars, that uh, there are many men. In fact, I had a gentleman who lives right next door to me who uh, 72 years old was a Vietnam veteran. Uh, he had been going to the uh, Veterans Administration Hospital in St. Cloud to get help with the problems of uh, his, um, um, oh, what was the name of the, the uh, uh, they sprayed it on, on, on all of vegetation, 2,4-D. Um, and, oh, Agent Moore? Yeah, and uh, he had that along with other complications from during Vietnam. And they, they the Ad Veterans Administration tried to help him reach out, but it got to the point where he became depressed. I didn't even know that he was depressed or even feeling, because every time I would talk with him outside and uh, we go to the mail together and talk and just chat, uh, I didn't have any idea that he was uh, thinking about this, but just uh, to uh, my wife and I would just talk about this, that uh, he, we came home and saw all the um, military, I mean, all the police squad cars, about four of them, along with the ambulance sitting outside of our house after I'd gone to a, a meeting that night and couldn't figure out what was going on, but then realized about midnight that they were carrying a body bag out of the home and it was him that had committed suicide because he had basically given up hope in trying to deal with the situation that he had uh, received while he was in, in uh, uh, Vietnam. And this was a long time ago. And so we're not only seeing Vietnam veterans, but recently uh, Af Afghan war vets and Iraqi veterans and people who are maimed. Uh, so we're, those two big things are, um, Adjutant General Mankey, uh, along with Commissioner Herkey, want to get tackled on. And we gave them partial of what they wanted, and we want to continue. At least they'll have their people there to uh, start up the uh, new offices within the uh, Veterans and Military Affairs to uh, uh, go after and, and try to get this done. So those are big things that are trying to help. We also received word just back in February that um, uh, four years ago, we had pushed for money for new veterans homes in Bemidji, one in Montevideo, and one in Preston, Minnesota. Um, uh, the, uh, Senator Senjum's uh, capital bonding bill came forward with money, $33 million uh, to fund these three homes. That was our state's portion. The feds now just came forward now in February to fund the rest. I think it's like 85 or $89 million uh, for those three veterans homes. And so hopefully we'll be uh, having some groundbreaking ceremonies here in the next uh, months or or maybe it'll be next year but we're we're looking forward to that
Senator Slazinski, I'm going to take uh, Senator Anderson up on his uh, suggestion that we ask you about that. So veterans issues. Yeah, well, I got to hats off again to Senator Anderson for being the chair. For I didn't ask to be on veterans five years ago when I first got elected. I was put on it and um, it, you know, it was, I found it to be the most um, um, edifying um, committee. I, I, can, I, I don't even know what else to say. And as, as Senator Anderson alluded to, um, or they didn't allude to it, he stated it, um, the, the suicide rate, the homeless rate, um, it's, it's, uh, it's just unbearable. And, um, and, and, you know, you hear the, well, you, anyways, it's, um, we can do a lot better. So I read this book a couple of years ago, it's called the, the tribe. And it's all about how, um, when um, veterans came home from the wars of, you know, the great, the world war one, world war two, um, in Korea, um, they came home and they had social networks. They had American legions, VFWs, organizations that you belong to, to belong to something larger than yourself. And you just talked and you shared your stories. And starting with, um, and, and as the decline in our culture to want to belong to um, civic organizations um, coincided with the war in Vietnam. And these guys started coming home and they didn't go um, down to the local legion or the VFW because they were closing. And now with the Afghan and, and um, uh, um, um, Iranian veterans, those places are even less than they were in, in the 70s. And um, so we've got a, a, a time bomb, a ticking time bomb on our hands if we don't get a resurgence, a renaissance in civic organizations. Um, today, or um, last um, summer, Senator Newton um, brought before the Veterans Committee uh, for a, a couple years, this Veterans Restorative Justice Act. Um, he brought it up. He carried it. We passed out a committee, I do believe, um, once or twice, Senator, three times, Senator Anderson saying, and then all of a sudden COVID hit this year and special session two, we, we brought it up and it was very divisive. And then in special session three, it, it, uh, it passed unanimously, and, but it, it didn't pass in the house as I, as I recall. So we, so, um, you know, it's, it's a bill, it's a good bill. We brought it up today as Senator Anderson um, said, and we passed it. And basically what it's gonna do is if you committed a non-violent, um, 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 felony and you're suffering from post-traumatic stress or something else and you can prove that um, the, the crime you committed as a result of your service to your country, that you, your, um, your, um, your the judicial process would be in a veterans court that would be statewide. And so it would be this, no matter where you live or your zip code, it'd be consistent, um, the treatment of you. And it's, it's, it's like, like Senator Anderson said, it's all, it's, it's going to help suicide. It's going to help um, sobriety and recovery issues. Um, it's, it's a game winner. I just hope during the process of and this one's for Senator Anderson's um, um, behind the scenes um, talk here. Um, I hope this plays out and that we get the bill passed, uh, however it happens, and um, we get it through the House, and it's, it's a good bill for the vets. Representative Carlson, veterans issues, your thoughts? Yeah, thanks, Barry. Uh, we owe a great deal of gratitude to the men and women who have served in the military, and uh, we can show that gratitude now by, by passing a strong veterans bill. Um, the Veterans Bill, as uh, Senator, Senator Anderson had mentioned, uh, has been combined with the State Gov Finance Bill. Uh, that bill is going to be brought, uh, the House version will be brought to the floor tomorrow. Um, so tune in. It uh, looks like we're at somewhere around 80 amendments have been filed. So, um, you know, find a comfortable chair as we uh, work our way through, through that work. Um, but that's up for tomorrow. And, uh, you know, we will pass that off the House floor and uh, send that to conference. So again, you know, these are some of the things that I think uh, we all can agree on that we need to make sure that we take care of our, our veterans. Just as we all are saying in terms of, uh, we might have different approaches in terms of how we get there. I think we all agree that uh, that's just a priority for us as elect officials, uh, just as our, our children are in our schools. So um, yeah, we'll, uh, We'll take that on tomorrow and uh, get that moving uh, through the process. So our viewers may be wondering, we've heard reference to veterans courts and I just wanna spend just a couple of minutes here explaining to viewers that what we're dealing with here are um, criminal justice um, uh, 
formats designed to help uh, people with a variety of problems. Uh, veterans courts are, are an example of that. We have a, a drug and alcohol uh, courts um, that uh, focus on sobriety. And what's interesting about all of these, what we now call problem solving courts, they're very expensive to operate, but uh, the social science literature is pretty impressive that we are in fact getting better results from these problem solving courts than we do uh, from some of uh, in, in sort of the normal criminal justice system where you've got people with complex mental health issues, complex drug and sobriety questions, and as uh, our guests this evening have talked about veterans with complex histories as well. And these problem solving courts are designed to deal with that. It's a whole team approach involving uh, treatment, pro treatment professionals, uh, as well as um, um, in the case of veterans courts, uh, veterans themselves, and in the case of uh, drug and alcohol courts, uh, frequently we'll have uh, members who are participating in the teams who uh, themselves may have had drug and alcohol problems, but have demonstrated sobriety over uh, decades of time. So it, it's, a, it's an interesting approach, um, and there's been some fairly rigorous uh, social science research about its effectiveness. So that's your uh, minute and a half lecture on problem solving courts, and we'll leave it there and move on to something else. Representative Carlson, we have a question from a viewer who wants to talk about the gas tax, wants to know whether or not there's anything happening on that. That, of course, is, leads us to sort of a more general transportation discussion. But let's start gas tax, transportation, floor is yours. Yeah, Barry, I feel like I should have, uh, I should just be on your show again next week. So the transportation bill is up in the House tomorrow. <laughs> so we'll have a <laughs> conversation around that. I believe that one has around well, 50 or 60 amendments, too. So, you know. If you haven't had enough watching uh, your legislature in action, we'll watch State Gov Finance and Veterans uh, Omnibus Bill tomorrow. Stick around; they'll be filed uh, immediately by. It's like a it's like a double hitter filed with the transportation bill. Um, yeah, so there is okay. Uh, there is a proposal being brought forward within the House related to the gas tax. I don't know. If that's. I don't want to speak out of turn here. Mm -hmm. Uh, what I will say is we, we need to find a sustainable way to fund infrastructure roads and bridges. Uh, now with uh, more and more electric vehicles that are just not filling up at the gas station, we need either to find a sustainable source or a, a way in which to, to fund this. Roads and bridges are something that every Minnesotan uses. Uh, we have a responsibility, a fiduciary responsibility to make sure that our infrastructure is maintained. And that's going to come up. Uh, as a suburban metro uh, house member, I see that every day, right? Um, you know, it wasn't too long ago where we had a bridge, uh, the 35W bridge fall into the river. So we have our, our fair share of examples of failing infrastructure in the state. And if uh, we don't maintain them, uh, we're going to continue to see uh, those types of incidents. So be it a gas tax, be it some other way in which to find a long-term sustainable funding source for infrastructure, um, you know, we're going to find ourselves in, in a bad predicament. So uh, be it a gas tax as part of a consideration for today or some other way in which to fund that into the future, we need to make sure that all options are considered. Senator Slusinski, gas tax, transportation. Yeah, I, um, Governor Waltz during his campaign called for a 20 cent gas tax phased in over, I, I, well, I don't, five years or something, um, whatever it was. I did support that. We, um, MnDOT has been begging for a reliable, sus um, sustainable um, revenue feed. And, um, and like, um, um, you know, Representative, Representative Carlson said, we all use the roads, we all use the bridges, we all use transit. Um, I'm sure Senator Anderson will weigh in and talk about the Rogers um, area when he comes into work and how that bottleneck is, is, is just one of the worst in the state. And, but, um, you know, the gas tax, it, it is a regressive tax. I get that. It's, but we need the money from somewhere. And, and as we start getting more and more zero emission and low emission vehicles and um, all of a sudden uh, the, that get, the gas tax isn't going to work anymore because so many of us maybe are driving electric vehicles and so it's a problem we got to solve it and uh, people of Minnesota 
are looking to us for leadership. Um, but bottom line, um, the, 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 um, we get D's and C minuses from engineering firms on the quality of our school um, when they when they grade our, our freeways and roads. And um, so, uh, you know, it's Minnesota and um, we can do better. And so um, anyways. Senator Anderson, the gas tax transportation issues. Thank you, uh, Barry. Uh, the transportation, I uh, believe, is coming up next week sometime. I don't know when we're going to get uh, a, a briefing on it, but uh, Senator Newman, Scott Newman from Hutchinson is the chair. He has said that there will be no gas tax in his bill. Um, and I also sit on the Ag Committee uh, where we are talking about mandating E15 uh, for uh, uh, corn uh, to be used to put into our gas, which allows for cleaner energy. And as the long range goal is to go to E25. And so that is one way to get our, our uh, cleaner energy, cleaner uh, emissions out of our cars and also uh, get better gas mileage. But as far as I know, uh, in talking with uh, Senator Newman that, that he's not proposing the gas tax at this time, we did uh, the last biennium, or was maybe it was four, year, four years ago, uh, did pass a $2 billion uh, over the next 20 years uh, increase in funding for transportation, for roads and bridges uh, to be dispersed uh, equally um, that, over those, that 20 year time period, which is the largest uh, increase in, in uh, transportation funds for just roads and bridges to meet the requirement of these small since the, the uh, bridge fell down in uh, uh, 2000, what, 2008, uh, that that bridge went down in, in Minneapolis. So uh, as far as I know, uh, there is no gas tax being recommended coming out of the Senate Transportation Omnibus Bill. And I'm sure that there's one coming out of the House. And so when we get to conference, there will be a discussion as to how to meet that or not meet that request by both sides. And so it's, uh, it's always a, a fine uh, road or fine line as to how to uh, decide how that's going to measure out and what where the funds are going to do. Again, there's federal funds coming in that we don't know if it's going to come directly to uh, counties, uh, whether it's going to go directly to townships for transportation uh, from the federal government. And so that's being taken into consideration also with this multi-trillion dollar bill that was passed, uh, what, a month or two ago? Less than that, maybe. So, Senator Swazinski, we have a question from a viewer in Benton County. He wants to know about whether or not there are any potential plans to remove um, state tax. I assume the viewers were referring to income tax on uh, Social Security, on seniors receiving Social Security. Uh, has that topic had any discussion? Do you have any views on that? Yeah, not on um, the three committees I serve on that has not come up. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, I, I do know that uh, I think we shouldn't be taxing Social Security. Uh, but I do know this. I think, God, what is the number? I, the majority of Minnesotans, the bill that came up, I think the Democrats, or I'm a Democrat, but the, the, um, my party proposed the tax. It would, it, the majority of Minnesotans would not receive any um, tax on their Social Security. It would only be on the upper tier of, of um of our retired um, residents that um, on their social security income. Um, so um, anyways. Representative Carlson, any thoughts on that issue? Yeah, so I, I serve on the, the House Tax Committee and we have an awesome tax bill that we'll be bringing forward uh, next week. I'm very proud of the work that we did in taxes. This is gonna be a bill that's gonna help Minnesota get back on its feet. This is gonna help Minnesota families. This is gonna help Minnesota businesses. This is gonna help Minnesota students. Uh, We've got uh, the fifth tier added in there. Um, I think it's fair to say that those that benefited the most during this pandemic should pay a little bit more uh, to see us through the recovery. Uh, and that money is going to be put to good use. That's going to, like I said, that's going to help our small businesses. That's going to help our main businesses. That's going to help our students get it, you know, get back on track. That's going to help our families, those families, those teachers, uh, those frontline workers, those folks that work at the grocery stores, those, those, those folks that put themselves at risk every day during this pandemic so that we can all go about our lives and be safe. So uh, very proud of the work done in taxes, uh, hoping that we can find a, 
good bipartisan support in that work and, um, and move forward in, in uh, seeing Minnesota through this recovery. Senator Anderson, we've got about a minute or so left. Uh, taxes, um, um, taxes generally, but uh, also this question about Social Security. Well, um, Senator Nelson, who is the tax chairwoman, uh, has brought forth a bill in past years to get rid of the tax, along with Senator Sengem, has brought the same bill uh, in past years to get rid of the uh, tax on Social Security. Uh, I'm guessing since she's the chair this year, Senator Carls, I mean, Representative Carl, Senator Carl Nelson, sorry, getting them all mixed up here. Senator Nelson will probably be presenting that bill again to get rid of the tax on Social Security, but uh, I haven't had, we haven't been briefed on that, so don't know yet exactly what's going to happen, but it's been, it's happened in our caucus before, so I'm sure it'll happen again. Uh, we've got about 45 seconds left. Very quickly, uh, roundtable. Uh, do you think we uh, get out on the constitutional deadline? Any special session or do we get out on that deadline? Senator Anderson, very quickly. Yes or no? No. Uh, Senator uh, Swazinski, your thoughts? Yes. And Representative Carlson, you get the last word. Out on, de out on the constitutional deadline or not? I'm hopefully optimistic. Uh, we're doing good work here in the House and we're going to keep that work going. So Let's get it done. All right, very good. I want to thank our panel, uh, distinguished panel of guests this evening, covered a lot of topics. I want to thank our viewers for your participation in the program. This is your program, and we appreciate the questions that you've sent in. I want to remind you that you can continue to send those questions in between now and when we come back next week, next Thursday night, for another session of your legislators. And we will be back every week until the legislature goes home, whether it's on the constitutional deadline or some other date. In any event, thank you for joining us this evening, and good night. There's much more about your legislators online at pioneer.org slash your legislators. Find out more about the history of the program, who has been a guest, and watch past episodes and discussions by topic. To continue the conversation, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of the Minnesota Corn Growers Association. From developing best practices that help farmers better protect our natural resources to the latest innovations in corn-based plastics, Minnesota corn farmers are proud to invest in third-party research, leading to a more sustainable future for our local communities. Additional support by Minnesota Farmers Union, standing for agriculture, working for farmers on the web at mfu.org.